Hello everyone, my name is Minou Shafiq and I'm the Director of the London School of Economics and I'd like to welcome all of you to this event from all over the world. Now, 2021 is the 21st birthday of the UN's Women, Peace and Security Agenda and when you turn 21 you really have come of age and many countries have used that opportunity to renew their commitments to this vital agenda but more importantly the frontline peace builders, activists and advocates and practitioners have continued to do their important work, which has become even more complicated in this era of the pandemic. And today's event is to celebrate that work and to recognize uh, its importance. I'm also very pleased to welcome back to LSE, Her Royal Highness the Countess of Wessex, who's going to be today be joining Visaka Dharmadasa and Abir Haj Ibrahim in this event. Her Royal Highness actually last visited LSC to, to uh, name three, for the first time, three of our major buildings at the school in honor of suffragette leaders who fought for women's right to vote in the UK. Uh, so she has been uh, a strong advocate of, uh, of women's issues at the school and of course in the world. And we look forward to welcoming her back physically to LSC uh, sometime very soon. Now, of course, we would have liked to be together, but the advantage of this format is that we've got participants from all over the world and we're able to bridge distance and time, zone, time zones and we're pleased that you could all join us. Today's event is moderated by Sanam Naragi Andalini, who is the director of the Center for Women, Peace and Security at the London School of Economics. And this is the first session of a series that we will be hosting throughout the year, marking the, our 21st birthday. So I wanted to welcome you again and turn it now to Sanam, who will introduce the speakers and frame the discussion for today. Sanam, over to you. Thank you very much, Manish. Uh, happy New Year. Um... Welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's really great to be here and um, I'm delighted that you can join me. I'm, I'm really excited about this first conversation um, that we're having in a series of discussions through the year um, that is really about the coming of age of the WPS, the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. But it's also, as, as uh, Baroness Rafiq said, it's, it's really about shining the light on the people who have been at the front lines of this agenda on the ground, um, in policy spaces, in places that we don't often think about, um, actually trying to realize the promise of the agenda. For those who aren't familiar with the agenda, uh, it's, you know, it, to, to put it very simply, 20 years ago, 21 years ago, in fact, um, in, in October of 2000, we had a global movement of women from across war zones and conflict zones, essentially going into the Security Council for the first time and saying women's voices, women's experiences of conflict, um, and violence and warfare need to be recognized. They need to be recognized in terms of where they are refugees and internally displaced people, where they are fighters, where they are peacekeepers, where they are peace builders. Um, we need to understand this dimension and that their, their right to be at the tables where peace and the future is being negotiated needs to be recognized and their expertise needs to be recognized. So that's really been the sort of at the heart of the agenda. And I think that what, one of the aspects that, that we sometimes forget is that uh, at the time, um, women, when they talked about peace and security issues, they also talked about their version of security. Um, 20 years ago, we were worried about HIV AIDS as a security threat. Fast forward 20 years later, there's COVID, but that notion of human security versus national security and where these things come together. Uh, 20 years ago, women were not just talking about themselves as they talked about the experiences of conflict. It's always been from the ground up talking about the experiences of the men and the boys and the children and, and others, marginalized groups and so forth. So it's bringing that human dimension of conflict into the spaces where power is discussed and actually the human face is so often lost. And yet what we've seen again in the last 20 years is that because we started talking about women, people said, well, what about young women? What about the widows? What about the disabled? And then what about the men? And what about the boys? And now we have a youth peace and security agenda as well. So it's really that, that broadening and that notion of, of inclusivity. It's always been about the prevention of violence and putting more effort into diplomacy. When I first met Abir, 
she said, why is everybody helping us kill each other? No one is helping us talk to each other. That statement has stayed with me oh, throughout the years, but it resonates again as we look through around the world and what, what's been happening. So it's, it, this agenda is very rich. It was very prescient 20 years ago. It's still relevant. It's universal. And it's been extraordinary in, since last year, again, when we had another kind of momentum around commitments from governments and, and actors coming in, how we see different people coming in and being engaged and wanting to make it real. So the sessions that we've sort of planned out for this year is really to, to bring that voice of the voice and the, and the experiences of the people at front lines, um, the pioneers, not just in their professional guise, but actually the human side of it as well. What is it like to be working and living in a war zone? Um, there is a level of extraordinariness um, that everybody has. And yet there's also a level of, we're all pretty ordinary people at the end of the day. And so how do you manage that, that, that tension? And, and I wanted, um, as we were planning it, I wanted to make sure that we brought this forward because in the last 20 years, we've had a lot of policies, we've had a lot of rhetoric, there's a lot of theory, there are a lot of dissertations that are being written. And somewhere along the line, this aspect of the fact that change happens because you have people who have commitment and care and consistency gets lost. And it's this side of the story that, that we're bringing. So I'm super, super excited to be kicking off this, this session with my guests today. Um, and, uh, and I've said to them that it's, uh, it's really like a conversation that we're having as if we're having tea together. We're not gonna pretend that there's a whole world of people watching because we want it to be as relaxed as possible. Um, and, and on a personal note, I wanted to bring this feel to our seminars because for 25 years, I've had the privilege of having these conversations with people informally around the world. And it is the most inspiring, and energizing um, experience possible. And I think with COVID and, and all the problems that we're seeing around the world right now, it's really a moment to just stop and say, there's, there are great people, good work being done, and let's channel that, that, that positivity. Um, with that, I'm gonna introduce my guests. Um, starting off, of course, uh, Her Royal Highness, the Countess of Wessex, super excited to have you and um, delighted that you will be joining the conversation. Uh, you joined this agenda about two years ago um, maybe not quite sure what it was going to lead you to, but I'm really excited to hear about what you, what your experience has been and, and, and what it means in the realm of all the other charity work that you do and, and, and sort of the activities that, that, that you're involved in. So thank you for joining us. Uh, Visaka Dharmadasa, a founder of the Association of War Affected Women, um, uh, winner of the 2006 Interaction Humanitarian Award, member of the Commonwealth Women of, uh, Commonwealth Network of Women Mediators. I mean, so many accolades. Visaka, director of the, um, of the board of the National Peace Council in, in Sri Lanka. Um, again, really thrilled to have you here. I'm not gonna tell your story. You're gonna tell your story yourself. Um, Abir Hajibrahim, fa founder of um, the Mubadarun Peace Actors Network, including something like 240 peace ambassadors across Syria right now. I don't think people would ever imagine that to be, to be such a case. Winner of the 2016 Livia Foundation Award for Peace. And you, before, before all this, uh, Abir, you were working in the oil industry. So, so you know, what on earth brought you and how did we cross paths um, is gonna be the story of, of, of the day. So um, again, welcome. And I'm gonna just kick off with, with the first question. Visaka, we talk about war, conflict, extremism now, which we have been amongst our communities talking about for many years, but has now become frontline headline news every night um, since the events of January 6th in, 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 the, in the United States. Um, the nature of conflict as we see it, the fact that it's the front lines are in people's homes and villages and towns, and the, you don't really know who the enemy is and, and so forth. Um, where was your, how did you come into this? You know, you've been at this, you, you're Sri Lankan, but, but you've been involved in this peace activism before we even had 1325. So, so can you tell us your story of what happened and how it came to you? Thank you very much. And a very happy new year to everybody. Uh, and I'm really honored to share a panel with your Royal Highness and as well Abir and Sanam. Uh, Yes, my story begin. Uh, I was a housewife helping my husband in his gym business. Uh, and my two older sons, they joined the Sri Lankan military. 
when they joined the military on the height of war, I was worried. So I got a couple of women together and we established this organization, a very small one, which we call the Candy Association for War Affected Families. But very soon, my second son, who was a, a military officer, was reported missing in action on the 27th of September, 1998, the day that I say the war was at my doorstep. We came together as mothers, wives. Uh, we want to know exactly what has happened to our children. So we established this organization, the Association for the Missing Families. And very soon we understood that if we don't work for peace, if there's no peace in Sri Lanka, there'll be many more mothers and wives, daughters like us. So the Association of War Affected Women was established and I never looked back. And I have been working for the last 22 years, every day, day in and out to see that not only in Sri Lanka, but the world over that people could live with dignity, their lives. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bisaka. I'm gonna come back to you around what you ended up doing as, as the Association uh, of, of Women as well. But let me just go to, to Abir um, for, for her introduction to this. Abir, you and I met in 2011, I think in Beirut, um, uh, and as a Syrian and as an Iranian, I remember you said, one of the things you said to me was, you're Iranian, but you're nice but you're nice, <laughs> um, but it was a moment for, for, for both of us, I think, in, in the sense that I, we knew the war and the conflict was happening and I was interested in where the peace builders are and all of a sudden I came across you and, and, and Gada, but how did you end up becoming a peace builder? Where, what, how, what, what was your journey? Um, actually, I was like um, living a very ordinary life um, and um, I was like uh, uh, having, enjoying Damascus as it is. Uh, you know, the smell of love in her streets, the hugs from the mountain, the good morning from the sun. So it was like um, a quite a good living condition that I was living in. And suddenly everything around me changed. Um, the friends were not friends anymore. The streets were full of dust. The sounds were the sounds of bombing, the fears in the heart of and eyes of people. So everything changed. The passion of love that, that the city was giving its, its people, it's stopped. So, um, and before that, I was like trying to have a kind of sense what doesn't mean to be a voluntary. And even I do remember that my friend Rada, she told me that we need to volunteer in something that we will uh, help the people of the South and the North to come together in a way or another. And this is bef before uh, the uprising in Syria. So I thought, I, I do remember I told her, what does it mean I volunteer? She told me that you need to work for free. So you know, why the hell I'm going to work for free? I'm working in the oil business and I'm very happy and I have a very good production. And the best ambitions for me is to be like a high potential employee in the oil business. So I will get extra bonus. This is what I was like thinking and focusing on. Then we started to have like a kind of voluntary work in the weekends. Uh, and our mission that was only to have like kind of cooperation between the northern cities and the southern city in Syria. When the uprising came to Syria, it was for me um, a, a shock because you, you, you see the friends, they are not friends anymore. And everyone took a different position. And there were so many external factors coming in my country that we didn't know why the hell it's coming, why there's a tent around the, the, uh, the country, why people are flooding. So it's like a shocking uh, um, period for me. So I thought that someone has to, to do something. And because we've been already working on opening dialogues, we thought that we have a major responsibilities 
to our community to restore our humanity again and bring back the dialogues on tracks on several levels. And here we start to build our own capacities. And uh, really, I didn't think that I am a peace builder until you have a frame it for me. I thought that this is what the usual people must do. This is that our responsibility everywhere. And even I didn't recognize that there is a file called Women, Peace and Security until I can and Wassel groups introduce it to me. I thought this is obvious, Yani, why we have to frame it. And later on, I, I knew that it wasn't an obvious thing to do. And there were so many faults that the humanity did wrong for women and especially for peace builders. And that we have a major responsibility to put uh, a, a kind of work and protection for these women builders around the, uh, the world, especially the young women leaders who are coming inside this like war zones in the Middle East where I, I am living. And I want to I want to have my life and other life people better somehow. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Your Highness, you were probably not aware of this agenda 20 years ago. Um, but somehow back in 2018, you something happened. How on earth did you walk into this world? And and there are different dimensions. There is the peace builders aspect. But there's also the sexual violence and and the the, the horrific things that that go on. So so there are th these aspects that are always interconnected. But yeah, what was your entry and and uh, what have you been doing the last few years that, that probably a lot of people don't know about? Thank you, Sanam. Well, you're absolutely right. I wasn't aware of the whole agenda 20 years ago, um, but for many years now, I have been working to try and support women in business. Um, so try to redress some of the balance across um, uh, executive and boardroom positions to try and actually encourage more women uh, to take um, a leading role. Um, and, you know, that that agenda is moving very, very slowly. Um, you know, we ebb forward, we flow back, um, and it's it's not easy. Um, and I had also been doing that work, not only here in the UK, but globally. And I was looking to do something more globally, um, aligned with that, that gender equality issue. Um, and this floated across my, my gaze. And I thought, there's no way um, I can I can contribute to this. This is so big um, and so complex that I, I to begin with, was uh, was very nervous of actually getting involved with it because I uh, I knew little about it. But what I started to learn was that there were an enormous number of parallels between the work that I'd been doing and the work that I and this work as well. So to be honest with you, I started to listen and I started to learn and I spent a long time um, in, the, in the early days discussing with people and talking with people um, who have been working in this agenda for a very long time uh, to try and understand whether I could actually play some small part um, and whether it was something that I felt I, I, I could take on. And to be honest, the more I listened and the more people I met, uh, it just drew me in. It's such a compelling, um, you know, role to play. Um, and it's, uh, you know, even if I can just influence in a tiny way, then I'll, I'll feel that it's important because this work is so vital um, and it's, it's, so, it's so needed. Um, and it's not, as you said, it's not just the work with women peace builders, but it's the other side that the impact that conflict has on people's lives, particularly with people who have suffered as a result of, of conflict related sexual violence. Um, you can't walk away from this kind of work as soon as you're involved in it. I mean, you know, you've just heard, you know, we've, we've just heard from Abir and Visaka that, you know, they were living normal lives and they were drawn in. Um, 
and I, as in my own way, have been drawn into it. And it's it's been the most extraordinary experience thus far. And I have no intention of walking away from it. Um, yes, I, I started life in the consulting business. I think I would have done really, you know, who knows where I would be now, but I couldn't I couldn't spend my life selling stuff when I when I got involved in this. So yeah, it's it's a, it's a, it's an addictive element, but but it's so compelling. And, and it's, it's also got to do with the fact that it's you meet the most extraordinary people. I, I often say that war and conflict brings out the worst of humanity, but it also brings out the best of humanity. And that's what we get to see. So and I'm going to come back this Visaka, coming back to you. Um, your when your son went missing, what did you do? Um, because again, what you did was probably as a, as a mother, it was the instinct of what you do. But when you think, when you step back, it was an extraordinary decision. So can you tell us a little bit about kind of what you ended up that really brought you into the realm of mediation and peacemaking and so forth? Yes. Um, when I think about it, of course, the first thing was that, uh, I mean, we, went to the uh, National, uh, International Committee of the Red Cross. And then I gathered the families. Initially, I gathered the families and then we had a, because we really wanted uh, to come together. Initially, we gathered the families and then we had a religious ceremony because we really uh, wanted, it was not that I had even planned something. And uh, because of that, I could get from the Sri Lankan military all the names and the addresses. I asked from them, and when they didn't take the initiative, I said, I will take, I want the uh, contact details. And I got all the contact details. But not stopping from that, the intention was exactly to go to the jungles, to meet the liberation tigers, to know exactly what has happened. And that journey, which I never even planned, we didn't plan um, to broker the ceasefire, but that particular journey of seven women, we had only a 22-year-old driver was a male, all were mothers of these missing soldiers. We went to the jungles in the height of war. It was really difficult initially to get uh, the permission to go there. But we managed to get that, and that particular journey exactly broke the ceasefire. I mean, when I really look back, I mean, we never went there to broke a ceasefire. But us going there as mothers, and also our ability to speak with them, listen to them, and build trust. And that particular trust is still, though, you know, 2009, LGT was caught, but still some people who are there, who have come, we still have a very good relationship. And I believe in my whole life, that's my biggest asset, people trusting me. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Abir, for you, um, I'm, again, when I think about Syria and how divided it was, and it continues to be, this, this idea that you're either on this side or that side, but you, through Mubadarun, you've always said it was a space for dialogue. It was always about bringing together um, people. Is there a moment or a, or a kind of an incident or an event where you realize that what you're doing is really um, important, not only at the grassroots, but also in the Syria, in the official Syria talks, right? Because it took a while for you to get involved in those. But is there, are there moments or incidents where you where you say you know you did it instinctively but now retrospectively you realize that that it was such a it was such a critical decision um, yes i do remember that when we called uh, some of uh, people uh, coming from diverse political backgrounds to a dialogues some of them actually there were like the high violent uh, uh, status in aleppo there was like a, a big um, uh, trucks between the eastern side and the western side of Aleppo, and there was a snappers who are snapping everyone trying to uh, come from east to west. So I do remember that there were so many people who wants to be engaged in the dialogue. They actually 
put their life into dangers and they actually cross across the streets where there are so many snappers and they come to dialogue they didn't uh, come across all this risk issue just to have food or yeah. or resources they came only for dialogue so you feel that uh, the people are putting their life into danger they are just to understand the other people's position. So there is a, like a, a great potential. Then you feel that once they are coming back, at least they are opening their spaces, uh, their safe spaces to, to talk. And at least they are not going to kill each other later on. So whatever happened, they might even protect the, the others who are in the other other camp of, of political backgrounds. So you so you are doing something essential. And when we talk to the UN entities, INGOs, etc., they said, no, 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 no. Now it's not time for dialogues. Now it's time for human resources. And we need to have like a lot of food inside the country and we have to serve the refugee camps. So I thought, you know, why the hell it's not important? You are not seeing that once they are coming, they are at least putting the violent aside. They are not going to fight or kill each other and the level of violence to be reduced in the area. So you feel that this is essential, but on the checklist of the UN, it is not the time for peace building. It was only the time for, for humanitarian yeah. relief. But uh, they didn't sense it because these are my people and we are knowing what's happening. There was a huge decrease in violence between the cities because of these dialogues. Royal Highness, when you hear these stories, um, does it, how does that resonate with you? Because it's so localized, right? And, and it's so, and, and it makes so much sense when Abir says it or, or Bisaka says it. Um, and then we come out and we go to the UN or wherever we go and, it, and it's, um, and, and there's a whole other conversation going on, right? Does it, does it, is there kind of, do you also feel the cognitive dissonance in, in the spaces that you go in? Very much so. Um, every single conversation that I have and have had with women peace builders, brings it down to the local level um, because these are the people that know what's going on. They live there, they work there, their families are there and they see day to day what is actually happening. Their sense and their understanding of the realities minute by minute um, is, is what is real. And of course, at the beginning, and this is why I, I sort of at the beginning was slightly hesitant as to whether or not I should become involved with this, because a lot of the people that I began speaking to were probably at a very high level. And, you know, we, we've all been to the UN, we've all, um, we, you know, surrounded by the sort of the, the dry side of it, where, where, where process is the important thing. This is what we do. And, and in fact, what Abir has just been describing, it was part of the process. And when you're on the receiving end of process and you're thinking, well, hang on a minute, we're living this right now. We can tell you what we need. We don't necessarily need that. Yes, there's a time and a place for all of these things, but perhaps let us tell you what the greatest need is now. And I, and I yeah, it's, it's, it, it just reminds me every time I have dialogue with anybody that actually we have to listen more to the people that are living and breathing it and the local resources and the local support and the local resolutions are often the most powerful um, and the time for high level discussion there is a time for high level discussion but actually so often conflict can be watered down or even resolved locally and I, I have to be very careful because, of course, I have to try and remain non-political about these things um, and non-critical. Um, but I, I think we just have to listen more and engage with more local people. And it's very difficult because, obviously, in the international world gets involved with conflict resolution. Um, but I, I think local resolution is really got such a and a, a more important part to play. And sometimes I think it is underplayed and isn't given the air that it perhaps should, should have. Thank you, thank you, exactly. And I'm just gonna, on that note about the local aspect and, and Vesaka, what you were saying about trust. If we think about the COVID, this year of COVID, um, where essentially the international community 
lost focus on our wars and our conflicts and all these places because everybody was looking domestically and inwardly, right, you know, for their own populations. But you were also living with it. Abir, you know, refugees in Syria and IDPs, they're living with COVID and, and everything. Um, where, what we've seen in the last year and, and, and you know, the weekly calls that we've had um, is that women peace builders became the first responders, right? It was the first ones to jump, to go in with the PPE and then the food and then the domestic violence and everything. But it was because they were trusted. And, and Visaka, I'm just, you know, again, for, just in terms of the two experiences, Syria and, 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 and Sri Lanka, the year of COVID, how has that affected your work? And you as peace builders, what was it that you've been able to do that others couldn't do because they don't have the necessarily the access and the trust and the local contact? Yeah, I mean, exactly. Because of the fact that people trusted and also we had um, we had connections to the grassroots. So initially, we were also able uh, because we trusted the women. We could also transfer money for them to buy the dry rations because that was the initial thing when the entire country was locked down. And also the women's group. I mean, I, I was really surprised they use their smartphones to con con uh, contact. The, the people with the food and also tell the people, you know, now the lorry of the bread lorry, the bread van is crossing the bridge, you know, so get the people to come and buy the stuff and also collect prescriptions from the elderly for one person to go and get the medicine and even uh, stitch masks uh, and also the soap. So, and also not stopping from there. They also uh, disseminated the health guidelines, the, the one that you sent to me, Asalam, that the importance of wearing masks. I mean, this, thanks to the smartphones, we could disseminate very widely, exactly, with visuals showing that, you know, the success is when everybody's wearing masks. So this was something which also, as you told, the trust level where people bought the mask and also listen. Uh, to the women yeah so that's the experience that i have yeah. yeah so this network of trust and then people just helping each other out um but yeah. based on the networks that you already had created because of the peace work very much so that's because of that yeah. and also we, we could reach everywhere not only like my area in candy or not only like like one uh, ethnic group but everybody and also the most important thing was that we could also mitigate the hate speech Wow, because there, I mean, in Sri Lanka, we had lots of these hate speeches on Facebook telling that the Muslim people are the ones who are spreading the disease and, you know, all these things. And the women could really mitigate those. And that was very important. So we did build peace even among the mid cold. Thank you. Um, Abir, what about in, in the Syrian context and the refugee sort of surroundings? What's been happening and what's been your net, what, what's your network been able to do? First, on a personal level or, or even on the leadership level for the moment, I don't think that we have the chance to be traumatized because there is a pandemic around the globe. We didn't have the time to sit with ourselves and to say, look, oh, we are locked down, we cannot, and we will be afraid from the corona, uh, COVID-19, and we will be afraid of ourselves. Actually, we didn't have the luxury or the time to think about that. Even I do remember when I first go to the first uh, PCR, I thought to myself, you know, I think I was among the 1,000 people who came first to do the PCR. So we didn't have the luxury to have a, a lockdown and to become like having more attention about our life, about, about our living conditions. I do remember that suddenly there was like a group on WhatsApp, the leaders of the local NGOs, all of us came together and we decided what shall we do? So what kind of resources we need to build? What kind of risk strategy and risk mitigation that we need to work around it? So I do remember after COVID-19 was spread and within the lockdown, the first risk mitigation workshop was online for everyone. So how we will mitigate this risk and how we will be able to deliver the resources to the people in need where everyone like forgot, forget them. 
And we try to have like a small seed funds everywhere so people can actually uh, bring more resources into the, uh, the camps. Unfortunately, there wasn't enough health care for the refugees. There wasn't enough even data about the numbers of the people who've been affected or how we could protect them. But we tried ourselves, our, we tried to do that ourselves, and it, was, it wasn't an easy task to do. So in one month's time, we've been like online everywhere. And we broke the, um, the prototype who is saying that the women have less experience in working with iPhones and smartphones and laptops. And they were, be, they were able to be engaged on these platforms very quickly, very easily, because it's the, it was the only connection. So networking, sharing resources, and sharing knowledge, three main things helped us to overcome the COVID-19 crisis in Syria and the neighboring countries. Um. I was just going to say that we, we may get some audience questions in, but if you have any questions of each other, um, please just jump in if, if, you, if you'd like to know more about, about anything that, that, that's going on and, uh, and so forth. I've got lots of questions, but, um, but is there anything that you would want to necessarily ask each other at this point? Manoush, would you like to join in if you have any? any... Yeah, it would be interesting to hear how um... COVID has changed anything, if at all. It, you almost sounded like it didn't have much impact on, on, on your work, but, but how has it changed things? Has it made you more digitally organized or has it, uh, yeah. I mean, Can I answer that quite only because um, having been involved and engaged with a number of these forums um, over the months since, since the pandemic started, where we've been discussing um, through Sanam um, what a lot of the women peace builders around the world have been doing, um, what's been really evident is, um, and certainly I'm sure that uh, um, Abir and, and, and Visaka will, will say whether I'm right or wrong, but certainly the impression that I've got is that this is really in some parts of the world has really embedded these women peace builders as being fundamental to the communities in which they have been working. Now they've been working and been fundamental to them anyway, but actually in some of them, they have that their, their profile um, has even been raised in a really good way because actually um, some of the people in authority have had to rely on them to do what they have not been able to do or haven't done. Mm -hmm. um, and so therefore their profile has been really um, brought to the fore and, and this has been a really good thing. So I, I do not wish a pandemic on the world in any shape or form, but you have to sometimes look at a situation and go, well, what, what good has come out of this? And actually, I would say on the plus side, that the respect with which these, these women are held, um, if, they, if they weren't already in positions of respect, which they are, but not necessarily respected by all different elements of, of people in authority to whom they have to speak to gain any kind of traction, I think they've gained more respect, which um, which is really good. And of course, they're dealing with something which is really affecting the entire society. It transcends any kind of uh, political divide. Everybody in the world is affected by COVID, regardless of what your, your um, political leanings are or not. And then on the other side, of course, it's allowing us to to connect with people, um, you know, talking about getting more women um, up to date with technology and being able to get them to be able to use technology, that has been a, a huge plus. Um, and us being able to connect with each other and, and stay in touch with the women peace builders around the world on a regular basis, being able to finding out what's going on, um, allowing them to speak to everybody and actually coming together because so often the work that they do is so hard, it's so draining, um, it's exhausting and it's thankless and actually allowing them to come together to talk to each other, to support them and encourage them. These kind of platforms have been so important and without this technology, um, we would all be in a very, very different place. So um, that again, I hope, has been a, a, a plus for people, but I'm sure um, Misaka and Abir will, will have their own views as well. Misaka, did you want to add? 
I mean, I totally agree with uh, Your Royal Highness because it, it all gave that status, especially um, like in my area, uh, the, the women are the one who took the leadership uh, for getting the essential food and, and the medicine for elderly. So that makes a big difference. Uh, we also managed to um, give the PPE equipment uh, to the, all the divisions of Candy Police. So they were very happy that you know, as women's group, we could do that. So uh, you're very, very right. And also the plus point is the technology where, where no matter where we are, we could manage and, and the community check off was we, we were able to, you know, to learn from each other and also, especially as I told, the visual that Sanam shared with me about wearing masks, this was very helpful. So, yeah, as well, yeah. though there's very difficulty, but there is plus points as well. This, uh, Abir, did you want to add? Yeah, it, it's kind of interesting because um, I've, I've got a couple of questions from the audience as well that I'm going to throw in here. But in a way, I sort of think of technology in its totality, because as the sucker says, we were, when the, when, the, when the pandemic hit, we were picking up things from the American you know, Center for Disease Control, getting them, simplifying them in terms of messaging for our, for our partners, getting medical kind of records to say, okay, this is the way, we, and then sending it through. And then we were seeing people turning them into cartoons and visuals because they were dealing with places where they were dealing with illiterate communities. Um, and then in Pakistan, we heard that, that the network of women peace builders had turned into a network of women who on their rooftops were sharing the information about hygiene and COVID and masks and so forth. So it was like going back, you know, from the 21st century, all the back, way back to ancient history in terms of how people communicate with each other. This communication was there. So it's been, it's been remarkable. And, it, and again, it, it's just these networks that we'd already created around women, women's peace building work that and, and because they were trusted amongst marginalized communities there, that, that could flip the switch and, and do this COVID work. And, and so, yeah, so I, I hope that, that that continues. But it brings me to, to the question that we have from um, uh, Eli Lena Warungu, War, Warungu, Eli Lena Warungu, who, um, who says, how do, we, how do we make sure that what, what uh, your Royal Highness, what you were saying about the local, understanding the local context and listening and hearing and have the designing responses based on the local realities, as opposed to taking off the shelf, the cookie cutter approach. This to me, I think is the biggest thing because as much as maybe the, the Sri Lankan authorities understand what you've done and, or in Cameroon or in Yemen, we've seen the changes. I do worry that when you bring it back into the international space, whether it's the international NGOs, whether it's the UN agencies and so forth, they still tend to want to design from their own perspective going down. And are you, are you worried, Visaka Abir, are you worried about how the world is going to come back again and kind of do what they've always done and actually not listen and not engage um, uh, your networks and, and people like you or your communities to have community owned responses to, to, the, to the challenges that, that we have? Is, is that a concern that you already see or has, or has the behavior changed already? Did you, Abir, did you want to respond, answer that? Yes, actually, um, this is one of the, the most strange issues that they come to you to support you in holding dialogues, but they don't hold dialogues with you. <laughs> Explain <laughs> that. <laughs> that. They come to support you about, for example, listening, hearing, and how they could, uh, and how you could be engaged with other communities. And they ask for the diverse people to come together to be like uh, engaging everyone and inclusive approach. But they don't have the time to sit with you and to listen what's really happening. It's, it's very worrying and it's not going to be end unless there was like a, a strategical decision which will be taken in a high level that we need to be engaged with local communities better. And we are trying to do our best in our national level then. We are holding lots of talks and dialogues with UN entities and doing a lot of context analysis, participatory planning approaches, um, interaction, um, uh, interactive uh, tools within the community. But still at the end, there is no enough resources, time and ears for you to, to, 
to listen to you and to engage you. And it's happening, it's not only in the COVID-19, it's uh, ongoing issues that ha happened all the time. In the COVID-19, they have this alibi that I have, we have like a, a, a global pandemic, so we don't have time. But in the real time, it's happening all the time. You know why? Because I think the ones who are taking decisions are feeling that they are employees and they have their duties to do. But once, and you can feel, feel that, yani, once you are dealing with INGOs or even another level of decision makers who are coming from an activist background, you feel that they sense you somehow. They know what you are talking about. And, and they bring more, more community-led uh, uh, initiatives for you. But yes, the fear is always there, but I don't know how it's going to happen unless they really have this decision that we need to listen with these women peace builders to be with them. And the agenda of women peace and security need to be on the table with the dialogue uh, uh, instrument and tools, not only as like a paper and documents and regulations on the policy levels. Thank you, Bisaka. Your thoughts? I mean, for me, I, um, I, I think, yes, uh, th this happens a lot because sometimes the activities is designed, you know, like thousands of miles away. But, um, you know, our experience says that we have to really change it to meet our needs. And that's why, Sanam, I always think like, when we went and met those women just after the Easter Sunday bombing and that bringing that 10 women together, I mean, for me, I always tell that such a small amount of money that we put for, to make that peer committees, mm -hmm. but the results are so big. The impact is, I mean, I can't even imagine because very recently, like, you know, two, three days ago, we had this familiarizing a workshop with another uh, six women to tell them like how to build the peer committees. And uh, this one lady comes from um, like South and she's also a, a, a Muslim lady. And when she heard that the women, the Christian, the Hindu women, and went to Khatan Kuri, this epicenter of, of the bombing, and clean the mosque. She said, you all went to Qatar? My goodness, we are scared to go there. Mm -hmm. But you know, they opened the doors, they opened the mosques for the women to come and clean. The same way, first initially when the, the uh, Muslim women, when they came with their cloaks uh, to the um, uh, church, the police came in and said, look, uh, you know, to, to Jeremy, they said that you are a Christian, but if you are bringing these Muslim women to the church, you have to take responsibility. In fact, I had to intervene from here over the phone and tell the police, look, if any of these women are involved in bombing or if they carry out a bombing, I'll take the responsibility. But they have come together. So they managed to clean the mosque, the church, even the Buddhist temple, because this particular monk is well known to be very a uh, hardliner, but they managed there. And even Jeremy was telling me that there was a bus, the pilgrims came there from some other place. And they were asking why Muslim women are cleaning the Buddhist temple, you know, why they're sweeping. Then two young monks came and told, we are living in this community. These are our people. Everybody comes. It's not only the Buddhists come to the, the Buddhist temple. You know, and then also they went to the Hindu temple. So very little money, but women taking leadership and that design, I'm, I'm so, so happy with that. So mm -hmm. thank you very much because it was, we both went together and decided that we should do this. Yeah, no, um, and, and it's, it's I'm, I'm always kind of struck by, it, 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 I'm struck by a few things. One is that, you know, you, you have a group of people and people, as you said, Abir, you know, people want dialogue, but they need someone to set it up. You know, you, you build it and people come, right? So, so there's that aspect of it. And then this thing that when people own it and it's their issue, then they just take it forward. Um, your, your Royal Highness, well, yes, you wanted to say- Yeah, um, I, 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 just following up on what Abir was saying earlier on, um, uh, it's, 
when people come and they are uh, with the with the structured um, way of doing things, um, I just wonder, and I, it's may perhaps slightly controversial, but I mean, sort of going back to my previous work um, with uh, gender equality, mm -hmm. gender inequality exists everywhere. Um, and so therefore the organizations, um, both at a very global level and, and further down, are they suffering from the inequality as well? So um, without addressing inequality everywhere, so that um, if, if you are asking uh, men to talk to women's, women's groups, it immediately creates a bit of a, a, a them and us situation in the first place. And certainly what I've experienced in the last few years is that there is a growing fatigue when we talk about women's issues, women's rights, you know, and, and as much as we have to keep talking about them because they are very real, um, what we're losing sometimes I fear in, in this whole um, drive towards promoting women's equality and trying to get more women around peacekeeping tables is that women are actually representative of society as a whole. Our aims and objectives are entirely holistic. We don't just look for women's rights. It's only one part of what we're doing. Um, they are men's rights, their boys' rights, their girls' rights, their, their rights of education, their rights of food security, their, their rights of health, um, they're everybody's rights. Um, and so sometimes when we divide it up into saying women's rights, um, it, it can be very off-putting, I think, for an outside agency to be coming in who's going, okay, well, what we've got to do is cover this, this, and this. And then they're, they're faced with a, a women's group and they're thinking, well, isn't that a bit niche or isn't that a bit um, controversial or a bit aggressive? And I, I just fear sometimes we, we go backwards before we go, go forwards because they're immediately on the back foot because it, oh, it's, oh, it's the women's rights again. And it's, it's really sad to say that, that there is this fatigue, but certainly I've seen um, quite a lot of evidence about it. And I, I don't know, you know whether or not the other two feel, feel that it, they're, they're finding it difficult. I certainly believe we have to keep going, but I, I wonder, do we talk about everybody's rights um, rather than just the rights of women and try and, try and lessen that kind of, that sting in the tail that, that sometimes I think the uh, male counterparts do feel. And, and just to add to that, um, I think this, this question of, you know, all of a sudden, just because you're a woman, you're only allowed to talk about women's rights. Whereas what we've been saying and, and what we see from peace builders is that we are women who bring a feminist or a feminine or however, whatever labeling we want to use or not to the lens of peace and security. And it's a different approach. So Bisaka, do you see this, this tendency of sort of being railroaded into, oh, you're only allowed to talk about this. I, I can give you one example. I was with the UN in Nepal. I led the UN mission to go talk to Maoists. It was the only mission that was sent in to talk to the fighters, men, women, you know, everybody. I came back and one of my senior UN colleagues said, you're only allowed to talk about what the women said. So I would have to sit there and say, the women are worried about the water being filthy and everybody, everybody was worried about the water being filthy, but I had to frame because God forbid I said anything else and it was, you know, they didn't want it politically. So it was very odd. So do you, do you feel this kind of this tendency between, you know, when we say, you know, women, you know, as a woman, you talk about everybody, you went looking for your son. I mean, it, it's, what's the difference and, and how do you manage these tensions? Yeah, I mean, I, I was, I was uh, really happy, Your Royal Highness, you speak the language that we speak. I'm, I'm so, so happy about that because you really got it. Especially because um, I also went to a Western embassy and I wanted to meet the ambassador, but I was told that the gender officer will meet you. I said, look, I came to speak about, you know, especially Isabel, I came to speak about a dialogue process. I didn't come to speak about women's issues. You know, so, so this was a constant fight, but I'm very happy to say that the Association of Rejected Women, we are the only organization in Sri Lanka who carried out very successfully a track to level dialogue process parallel to the official negotiations. So we do speak. I mean, I really want to 
keep one step forward, Salam to tell, like why we do say that we need to be at the peace table. It's not because we are half the population, but because we bring a whole new perspective to the negotiation table. Because we do bring compassion, we do bring the emotions such as love. But having said that, I must also say, we love our countries equally. We are concerned about our economies. We are concerned about the foreign policies. We do need strong economies as well. We do need evolving and non-aligned foreign policies. You know, so we also do need all this. We speak about education, we speak about economy. It's simple, as you told initially, in short, we do bring a human face to the table and that's why we want to be there. Thank you. Abir, what, yeah. how has it been for you in terms of the, navigating these spaces? And I know that you, you chose not to be in the Women's Advisory Board um, with the Syrian process and you wanted to be in the civil society room. So again, what are the tensions that, that, that you come across and, and handle these, these issues? Yes, um, I do remember that the first meeting for the Syrian civil society rooms, it was like only me as a, a female and there was around me around seven to nine uh, males. So I do remember the moment that the Office of Special Envoys came and he said, look, you are the only woman we have to deal about that. So I said to him, don't worry, I can manage 10 men. <laughs> but we need to bring more women just for not only for not leaving me alone with the men because I'm not afraid of them because this is how it have to be and I was very happy actually to know that there are so many great Syrian women who formed the women advisory board uh, and I knew that it was like one of the moments that we will have so many challenges because it is the first time but I was happy to know that these women are paving the way in a process for so many women coming later on from other nations to form the same structure of Women Advisory Board. So we have been providing a sample to follow to others. That was very important for me. I thought that Women Advisory Board are not going to only think and speak about women rights. They engaged and they cross cuts the women's rights in all the constitution issues and articles that they've been talking about. And me in the Syrian civil society rooms, I thought that this is my place. Mm -hmm. I'm not um, a very good speaker about women's rights because I practice it by default. So, um, and that was like the, the, the dilemma between the Syrian civil society rooms in Geneva and the Women Advisory Board, but it's all the time consultation and advisors. We are only giving consultations and advisors. And when it comes to the decision and the, for the agreements, we've been kept away. So this is our international struggle everywhere that, uh, once it comes to who is going to sign, a pen holds by the, uh, the hands of a man is going to put the signature on it. And this is where we need to change. So it's only on the consultation and the advisory uh, uh, level, but really inside how we are going to pave the constitution, it's very difficult for us to be engaged and we need a lot of effort putting on the table, on the UN level and in the community level, just to bring more women on the table, as Visaka said. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to, so we have a few minutes left and I have a bunch of questions, but I wanted to, before we come back to those questions, and I'm, I'm conscious of, you know, people who have, who, you know, uh, Paul O'Neill from Rusi has raised the question about peacekeeping, has peacekeeping become a men's domain and peace building a women's domain? We'll come to that in Visaka, I'm, yeah. Um, uh, you know, where, where are we going with the WPS agenda and, and, and so forth? And, and, you know, these national action plans, should they be localized? Uh, you know, do local people hear them? But before we get there, I want to just ask on a very personal level, um, when you enter this world of peace building and, and peace and conflict and war, we all get to know things that we cannot unknow. Um, we read things, we hear from our friends and our, and our colleagues around the world, you meet the women, the stories are there. How do you, 
how do you cope when you go back home? How do you deal with separating your personal life from what is effectively a cause or a professional existence, our families from our, from our work? Um, but what gives you the strength to carry on when you know the, the, the stuff that's happening? And, and Asaka, I know for you, this is deeply personal because, of, because it is your family. But more than your family, you've now heard the stories of so many others. So, so again, I just, it, it's, it's a, and, and as peace builders, um, and Royal Highness, I was, I was thinking about, about you, and your first response again, it's not about me, but it is about you as well, right? So I just wanted to sort of, how do we, how do you cope? Um, and I'll give you one example. Um, I'm often given books about atrocities. You know, it's my birthday and I get, you know, it's as if, you know, people think I'm really earnest and all the time I'm reading. And I'm like, no, give me something, you know, I want to watch Friends, right? You know, I don't like watching heavy duty document. You know, there's just different ways in which we cope. But part of it is that we need a lot of lightness in our life otherwise. But, but these divisions um, and, and the, how our lives meld, um, what is it that, how have you dealt with it? And what, where are the moments where you, it's been hard? For me, it's also the sisterhood. Mm -hmm. You know, this particular conversation is really relaxing. We feel so good. And also, especially your Royal Highness, I'm, I'm so happy because, you know, having you among us, being one of us, gives us enormous courage. And not only the courage, but it's also security for us. You know, it, it builds a big security net around us because you're being with us. So that's something very, very special for that. And Sanam, what you ask, you know, when I was very small in, in school, I can remember the singing nun, the film singing nun. You know something, in the evening, before I go to bed, I put the singing nun songs. And that's what I listen to, all this do, re, mi, the sound of music. So someone will laugh whether it's a, you know, like whether it's a teenager in the room, but you no, know, this is exactly which helps me. So I listen to all these songs, beautiful songs. Uh, that's what I do personally and I, because I think we do need that space yeah. as well. Yeah. 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 How do you do? It's the solidarity which I see it in the eyes and the messages and the emails with all uh, with the women all over the world. It's also uh, the faith and it's not only the faith of the religious, the faith of the power inside each woman. So I do have a big faith that we can all together come together, come together to a change on that issue. And, and one thing you remember, uh, Sanam, in the uh, Wassel Forum, uh, before it was I Can Follow Me, Annie, uh, when I saw that there were so many people just like me, have the same experience, like Visaka and like the others, so many uh, great women around the globe. It's helped me that I'm not a victim of the war. No, I can change the war. And we are not on inside the circle of the victims. I get so many courage coming from all of our uh, uh, colleagues in peace building uh, uh, profile. And that's make me, I mean, happy uh, each day and I do listen to Celine Dion songs I am alive from time to another <laughs> for you how has it been because you've again you've been on the peace building side you've seen you you deal with the victims uh, of sexual violence. I mean I think everybody does Abir you deal with with victims as well the soccer so how, again, but, but you come back to a whole different world and, and a different role at home and, and uh, as well. What's it like? Um, do people at home know what you do, do you, you know, when you go to a dinner party? <laughs> well, um, I always think that, um, you know, I, I can be in a room with one or two other women or with a group of women, um, particularly those that have been um, the survivors of, of sexual violence. Um, and to hear their stories, you know, when you've got tears dripping off your chin, I mean, you just, you can't help but but weep with them because they are so 
terrible these stories and and you know I, um the, the the four of us here we we know these stories we we hear them so often and it doesn't matter where you are in the world um they are they they're, they're dreadful um I, that is doesn't make good dinner party conversation clearly mm -hmm. and also i feel that the trust when somebody has actually revealed something that is so deeply personal to them they trusted you with their story. Now, they want you to help them to, uh, to, to take steps forward. They want people to know that this is happening to them, um, but they don't want to, you know, they don't want you to necessarily share real detail with people. So I, I do keep that to myself, um, but I certainly feel that every story that I, I am told uh, is pushing me forwards to try and support them, to help them to destigmatize the whole issue of, of, of conflict related sexual violence, um, to try and uh, to raise the awareness that sex and rape and torture is used as a weapon of war because I think so often, and I, and I, I, I can't speak for everybody, but um, if you live in, in, in the Western world, it's actually you don't realize and you don't know that this is happening. You don't realize that in order to suppress um, a population, that to, uh, to, to perform the most basic and most horrendous acts on people is a way of suppressing people. It's a way of, of euthanizing people. It's, it's, it is used genuinely as a weapon. And I think most people just don't know about it. Um, so we have to, I feel very obligated to, uh, to tell people that this is happening. Um, I try not to share intimate details because it's traumatizing. It's traumatizing to hear of it. Yeah. Um, and so it's not my story to tell, it is purely their story to tell, but I support them and it, it's heartbreaking. It really is heartbreaking. And I've gone to some very dark places, um, you know, internally, but um, I'm not living it. And therefore, if they can survive, if they can put one foot in front of the other, then for goodness sake, of course I can. And then of course, actually I have to tell you the pure joy of working with these amazing women peace builders. I mean, the, the events that we go to, and on, you know, Abby and Vizaka, you know these events, and they are so uplifting. We have a lot of fun. Um, you know, I said earlier on, Vizaka, I miss your hugs. I really genuinely do because they are their joyous occasions because it is the sisterhood coming together to support each other, um, to feel part of something that is so crucial, so important. Um, every single person in that room, the pure selflessness of the people in that room is so powerful. And they want to learn from each other. They want to share with each other. They want to support each other. They all look at each other saying, you know, I think your situation is a bit worse than mine. Heck, I'm sitting there going, really? It's none of it's really very good, but you know what? You're doing amazingly. You're doing the best job that you can. And I know that they go away from these events so buoyed up because as I said earlier on, it's so often, it's so thankless. Um, it's so exhausting and draining. And, you know, that's just the, the peace building side let alone knowing the stories and trying to support the communities and the people that have really suffered so badly uh, physically and mentally um, that, you know, it, it's so multifaceted. But um, so how do I deal with it? I get, I get the joy and I get the sadness and I get everything in between, um, but it's so compelling and it's, um, it's so important that you, you you let it let it through. You have to let it through, um, and you and then you put one foot in front of the other and go on. And as I said, I thankfully there, but for the grace of God, I am not living that. So therefore, I have no excuse to feel sorry for myself. Thank you, thank you. That's uh, that's that's. I think all of us have, on love, some level feel that, and and it's uh, it's yes, the, the surprise of what it means to be in a room full of peace builders and how much amazing joy and 
fun and humor there is, um, is something that the world should, should experience at some point. I'm gonna come to the questions. We have a few minutes. So we have a couple of questions from students from Charlotte Bream from UCL, from Natalie Lempert from uh, um, a graduate student in Virginia about where do we want this agenda to be and where is it going, right? And, and in a way, maybe, I'm, and I'm, gonna, I'm not even gonna talk about 10 years from now, I'm gonna say by the end of 2021, if there were two things or three things that you would like to see normalized in our peace processes, in our whatever humanitarian assistance, in whatever realm that you see that, that we for years we've been talking about and hasn't happened, but if there are two or three things that you think should now be systematized, Last year, we came out with a protection framework for peace builders. We came out with 10 points of practical operational guidance on getting women to peace at the peace table, uh, women peace builders at the peace table, financing of organizations. So the, the, we know what needs to be done, but practically speaking, by the, where should this agenda be going in terms of really show, showing the success of it? And then um, the other, and, and I'm gonna put the questions out, you decide which ones you want to answer. But the second question is around peacekeeping. And you know the realm of it's very, you know, typically it's seen as a military space, military security space. But Osaka, we've talked a lot about the importance of having women peacekeepers. So where do you see, and, and what do you think security organizations should be thinking about? And then thirdly, it's it's really a sort of around the issue of national action plans. And you know, do they sit in the ether and have no relevance to anybody, or are they really rooted? And and how do we make sure that? People on the ground know that their governments have national action plans, um, or that even one step further, that people on the ground know that the international community, the UN, the US, the UK, any of the countries that give them aid actually have their own national action plans that say women have to be included, that responses have to be gender response. How do we, you know, is this, you know, with the technology and so forth, is there now a way of really informing people so that they can challenge? The, the, the suppliers of this of this assistance what what do we need to be doing next so three questions i'm going to put them out there but essentially you know bottom line it's if we imagine by the end of this year what would you like to see as in the coming of age of, of the women peace and security agenda um what you know this time next year what would you like to say yes we did it at least we did this um uh, who'd like to start Masaka? By the end of the year, knowing very well the journey is pretty long and also tedious. Uh, I don't want to wish uh, a lot, but this has been always in my mind that we do need to demand from the highest level, especially from the United Nations, whether they can, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big ask, but a paradigm shift to be a peace council instead of a security council. I think that's also what LSC wants to ask, because I think it's extremely important to understand that security is very much tied with sustaining peace. So whether we could call, no, and I will tie uh, my um, the answer to also the peacekeeping together to tell that we do definitely understand people have guns and they are fighting. I mean, we are not ignorant of that. We are not ignorant at these lives. But what we are telling to increase women in peacekeeping, to bring that compassion, that human face to what they are doing, because that we believe that can make a big difference. So that's exactly my dream for 2021. So hopefully, we, we do need to work very hard to go there. Thank you. Have you? Actually, I would like to see more women mediators uh, uh, doing a mediation on the track one level, lots of women. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope that we will have less conflict, but still the conflict will continue. So I, I want to see more women mediators in UN, in Geneva, in New York, everywhere. This is what I'm dreaming of. Also, I would love to see the women peace and security agenda on the social media, mm -hmm. talking that to the people uh, with the influencers 
more influencers on the social media are talking about women, peace and security. More high profile people, actors and the track 1.5 people leading, talking more on women, peace and security. And having the, this agenda, uh, speaking of the language of the streets. Thank you. That's Putting great. Inside the streets more. And that's why we're doing these sessions. Um, uh, Your Royal Highness, a few last words on or last thoughts on, on these things. What would you like to see? I think what Abia just said is absolutely right, um, because certainly some of the uh, uh, dialogue that I've heard is that the Women, Peace and Security Agenda 1325 is so far away and feels so far removed from the real life and it feels like something top down and they, it, it doesn't feel relevant, I think. Um, so actually what Abir was saying, I think is, is really important to actually bring it down to grassroots level and help people to understand what it means to them and what it can actually help, you know, achieve for them. Um, there's one other thing that I would like, which is slightly on, on the adjunct to uh, Women, Peace and Security, um, but is uh, relating to the prevention of sexual violence and conflict, but it's actually, I, I really want to see an end to the stigmatization of people who are survivors of, of sexual violence. It has, to, it has to end, it is no fault of theirs. And, I, and we have a, a, a big task to do that. Um, and, but I, I think without reducing the stigmatization, um, these people find it so hard to even live their lives. Thank you. As, as we always say, I always say it's, we have to shift the shame and shift the fear from the victims to the perpetrators. Um, that's, that's really the kind of, um, thank you so much. We are one minute over time, which is extraordinary, but um, it was a great conversation. Uh, next session will be in February. It'll be about extremism. Uh, so watch the space as we tell you who's gonna be speaking and uh, the dates. And we will do a session on peacekeeping as well. And I'm hoping to have Patrick, General Patrick Khmer with us for that one. So um, we will set the dates out and look forward to welcoming everybody. But thank you to my guests today. It was really fabulous. Um, and I hope we can do this in person one day at the LSE. Um, but for now, stay well. Um, a huge, huge thank you to all three of you and, and, um, and see you soon for that, for those hugs. Absolutely. Um, thank you very much, Royal Highness. Thank you, Abir. Thank you, Visaka. And uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.